Hello everyone, this is Elisa Baum, Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct some housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me okay? And let me take a look. Okay, great. I see hands. Thank you very, very much. Okay, next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible. And those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog. In addition, I'll make sure that everybody here uh, gets a recording of this webinar and links to the slide within 48 hours. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar called To Shard or Not To Shard, That Is The Question, and it's being presented by Percona CEO Peter Zaitsev. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Peter. Peter, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Elisa. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, or whatever other time of day uh, there is now uh, in your place. So today we are going to talk uh, about uh, sharding, uh, wherever sharding is right for your application and if you choose to shard, what kind of technologies you want to consider. First, uh, let me tell you a story which actually prompted me to, uh, to create this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, the story is with uh, one of the customers coming back to me a couple of years uh, ago and uh, asking advice on how he should shard. I asked him why do you think you should uh, shard to begin with and he would tell me, well, I attended this uh, the wonderful uh, conference of yours, I talked to uh, Facebook, I talked to Twitter and they all uh, talk about uh, how sharding is an answer how to design your system. And I would tell him, well, let's talk about your system. How does your system look like? What is your database size? Well, it's about 10 gigabytes. Well, hmm, perhaps you have some very slow and complicated queries. No, he said, I uh, only have a few hundred queries and my database box is uh, load is in maybe a few percent. Well, uh, I would ask him if he's maybe just started his application and planning to have absolutely uh, explosive growth and that's why he uh, needs to, uh, to shard. No, in uh, uh, his case the application was around for about five years and he expected just about 10% uh, uh, growth in the amount of users the next uh, next year. Right. My advice to him was uh, obviously not to look uh, in the, into a shard because there is no need for his specific uh, circumstances. And frankly, chances are he would never need to shard in his uh, application unless the growth pattern changes significantly or he develops some complicated features and gets a lot of data or very complicated queries. Because with 10%, technology advances would be able to improve performance uh, faster. So, uh, things to uh, consider here is first, before you decide how you want to shard, is you better to really understand wherever sharding is really needed for your application. Second thing is you need to uh, understand what with a modern technology you can go much further uh, without sharding, much further than uh, you could, for example, five years ago. And by the modern technology, I mean uh, everything, right? Uh, we get the hardware advances, we get uh, the uh, MySQL and operating system being uh, much better. And what uh, uh, all that brings us to a single MySQL instance can really do quite a lot, right? We can get more than 100,000 queries a second to really uh, write uh, or modify more than 100,000 rows per second, scan more than 5 million rows and, and so on and so forth. And these are not their uh, some peak benchmark numbers. These are actually pretty modest numbers which are a lot slower than the peak numbers you would get from, from some uh, benchmarks. If you look at the uh, recent benchmarks published by Oracle on some pretty big iron, they are able to push close to 700,000 uh, queries, uh, queries per second, right? So, um, 100,000 is 
uh, quite modest. So looking at that, we can uh, do some math, right? So if you take a look at the hypothetical application, which uh, has about 3 million daily active users, and each user has 30 interactions per user per day, which is actually a lot, because uh, even very high, uh, this number would correspond to some very high, high engagement websites uh, such, as, uh, such as Facebook. And if you look at about the 10 queries per, uh, per interaction, which is again pretty high number because a lot of uh, uh, modern systems are built with Ajax-based or, or interactions which typically don't trigger so many queries. And then we go ahead and uh, uh, yeah, use about 3x multiplier to differentiate between your peak I don't know, during the working day or, uh, or evening, whatever it is for your application versus the average. So what is it going to, uh, to be? Well, for such application, which is quite significant, we still will come up to just about the 30,000 queries a second, which is well within what uh, a reasonable MySQL installation um, uh, can do. Now, this is all the theory. Do I have uh, any practical examples? And uh, I do, right? One is uh, probably known uh, in the industry is uh, is 37 signals, which has been long advocates for a simple application development structure, and they have been uh, using some high power hardware instead of sharding for a very long time. They had uh, uh, when I spoke to them last time, they did not uh, use a sharding, and they had um, many millions of users for their uh, base camp application. Another case is the enterprise which has 100,000, oh, 200,000 plus employees which have an internal Drupal application which is set up as a landing page, like uh, which opens up in the starter browser and they, they use for all kind of a product information and uh, pretty actively in the day. We have seen that uh, done with, uh, without sharding with, uh, uh, with Drupal and also really not uh, has a very high system utilization. Another example would be the e-commerce merchant with, uh, uh, with more than 10 million of sales per month, again, well served by the single node uh, without, uh, the, uh, without much problems. Now, a thing to consider uh, about sharding is sharding is really quite painful, right? I mean, if you uh, look at that, uh, in most cases you would like to avoid the sharding, and you shard even though it's painful. Now, a lot of uh, larger applications out there, they already got used to, uh, to this pain, they build the infrastructure around that to manage the sharding quite, uh, 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 quite conveniently. But that doesn't mean the pain uh, has, uh, has completely go away. So what kind of pains does the sharding generally bring to us? And in this case, I uh, talk not just about the MySQL sharding, by sharding in, uh, in other systems as well. Well, it is development complexity, right? In, uh, unless your sharding is, uh, is completely transparent, then uh, your uh, development process may become more complicated and less agile. Now, the thing, uh, interesting thing is even the sharding is transparent, right? For example, with uh, uh, MySQL cluster, developer always often has to have an additional knowledge about what the hell is going on uh, inside to be able to write high-performance applications. Using transparent sharding without understanding how the data is sharded is a recipe for disaster. There is also the operational complexity, right? Uh, for example, if you're speaking about uh, uh, running an ultra table for a thousand tables instead of one, it's more complicated, right? Uh, managing uh, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, environment uh, things which often have to happen in sharding environment such as uh, shard splitting, load uh, balancing between different shards uh, and so on and so forth. These are all, all the complications. Uh, also, what we see is uh, what technology 
is generally more complicated uh, when uh, sharding is in place. Wherever you uh, take that uh, on your own and have some uh, manual sharding solution, use a proxy or uh, have a database which has uh, internal sharding built in, that is, uh, becomes a distributed system which is a, a lot more complicated to understand and troubleshoot than uh, the single node system. Right. So this system uh, generally will exhibit some more uh, complex uh, failures than you would uh, 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 see with a single node system, you may be dealing with the cases, hey, well, I have a uh, transaction which have to modify five shards, but I only could modify three of them and one of them fail. What should I do? Right? Uh, 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 things like that. And also complex performance profile because uh, uh, performance of operation of such system will depend on uh, going through network and Hilton multiple nodes instead of one. But now the MySQL sharding is especially complicated because as we'll go uh, forward, there are no very uh, good tools for MySQL sharding, uh, which would say, hey, well, this is a standard sharding approach of MySQL, which everybody uses, and it uh, tries to make sharding uh, the least painful it can be. Now, if you are building the application which is on the steep uh, ramping up curve, maybe you won't be able to avoid sharding forever. But uh, that m means the good idea for you maybe to uh, to delay the sharding, because well, uh, uh, sharding early will often reduce your agility right uh, right now, and it's much uh, better. Too often to invest into a sharding when you are uh, already have a strong uh, strong market uh, market position, right? And probably more resources you can uh, to invest into a sharding. So, what kind of strategies we can use to delay sharding? And there are multiple dimensions uh, in this case which I uh, listed here, and I'm not going to. Uh, read the slide now because I'm going to go through them one by one. The first thing which can help us with, uh, uh, with delaying sharding is the proper application architecture. In a lot of cases, uh, we can uh, try instead of creating the uh, big monolithic application architecture in a data store, to build our uh, application uh, service from some smaller blocks which each of them owns its own data. We have uh, heard those called uh, microservices as a popular, uh, popular term. Now, in your case, even MySQL may not be the data store for all of them, right? Another trend we see is what you may uh, choose to use a different data store for those kind of uh, different services, uh, or microservices in your in your architecture, which makes sense. But uh, wherever that is a single uh, technology like MySQL or different one, if your data is chopped in different pieces and each service owns its own data, then uh, amount of load for you will be uh, uh, for on each of them will be uh, lower, and then you may not need to shard each and every of those microservices. You may not need to shard all of them at the same time, and when you shard one of them, it's uh, likely to be an uh, easier project than uh, dealing with some very complicated monolithic application. The other question, which comes with uh, on the data itself, all right? If you look on the uh, on the data. Uh, it's good idea to functionally partition that by keep the data which was separate in between uh, separate. The good example of functional partition uh, would be if uh, I have, let's say, a website which has a uh, forum, it has a blog, it has Drupal website. I don't really need to keep them all in the same MySQL da database and keep dependencies. In a lot of cases, making sure you uh, uh, functionally partition your data and you always have an option to move them to the different database boxes can be uh, can be very helpful 
to uh, to manage your load. The next approach uh, to uh, delay in the sharding is using of replication, especially if a problem uh, why you're considering uh, the sharding is uh, scaling of uh, reads. Replication is uh, is great, right? Because you can set up multiple slaves and route uh, reads from them. Now the trick of replication, though, is you have to uh, be aware what replication is uh, asynchronous, right? And so uh, your reads may be uh, uh, reading the stale data. So that requires uh, some more uh, more elaborate uh, design and, and also introduces some uh, uh, complexity. You also can consider using a uh, Pyrconix RDB cluster in this case, which also allows you to scale uh, rise with uh, by, uh, scale reads uh, and uh, it also has or can be configured to use synchronous replication with no scale uh, with no uh, stale reads which can be uh, easier to use for development team. Now the next approach for us to scale reads is a caching. There is a lot of different caches, right? Like there is a query cache built in in MySQL, which is frankly uh, uh, usable only in very niche cases because of uh, how it's designed. But what we very commonly see used is things like an application server cache. When, for example, some data is just going to be loaded on the start or cached in your Java application server, right? Or, or uh, to whatever other language you use. Memcache uh, and Redis are technologies which have been in use for caching for a very long uh, time and they uh, can serve as a very uh, high performance cache. But I also wouldn't uh, discount two other kinds of caching. One is uh, when you actually cache the data in the MySQL itself. You build some sort of uh, summary tables or uh, other kind of tables which uh, contain some summarized data, even, uh, uh, even as a cache or just uh, being always uh, maintained for you. That can be a uh, very good uh, strategy to uh, help with performance. And then often uh, it's a good idea to take uh, and see wherever you're caching properly on the higher level. Wherever you're using proxy server or just uh, relying on your user's browser cache, by setting proper uh, HTTP expire headers, you often can offload their uh, load to a database uh, dramatically. It is not really kind of a DVA job to think about this, but uh, uh, it, uh, uh, if you understand that, that often can be a recipe for uh, dramatically reducing database workload. Now let's talk about uh, uh, scaling rights. Well, one of the techniques to uh, scale rights pretty well is uh, to use queuing. And if you look at that, there are a lot of uh, large-scale application would use queuing in one or other form. In which case can it help us to uh, scale rights, right? On which way it helps us scaling rights? Well, first, it allows us to balance the spikes, right? Instead of uh, a lot of updates just get coming in exactly that second and overloading the database, all that work can go in the, in the queue and can be processed over a period of time without overloading the system, right? While the user enjoys a very quick response time. It can also often batch works. Uh, work. That means uh, several uh, similar requests, for example, touching on the same data set can be processed together and as such be done much more effectively. In terms of technologies which are used for queuing, there are a number of choices. Some of them are uh, language specific. What uh, I uh, hear uh, a lot about users is using Redis again for queuing. RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, Kafka. Some people use queues uh, in a MySQL as well, which is not uh, their most efficient way of doing that, but which can uh, can work on uh, on a, uh, a small and medium scale. Now, uh, what is also important to understand is what a MySQL is not uh, their 
only game in town. In uh, many cases, when your need kind of for uh, your consideration of sharding is driven by only some things are not working well, uh, if your current database systems can be done by uh, going beyond MySQL and deploying some other technologies. So, uh, for example, uh, if the problem uh, is some large-scale analytic queries, deploying Hadoop and using that to give MySQL may make sense. We also had a number of customers being very successful using, uh, using Vertica. Uh, now, if there is a full-text search, which is a problem, then, well, MySQL full-text search uh, is known not to scale uh, very well, and uh, using solutions like Elasticsearch, Sphinx, or Solar can be a, a very powerful uh, supplement for that. Now, in some cases, the relational data store may not be the best uh, solution for you, and uh, in this case, using uh, data st document store systems such as uh, MongoDB or uh, Couchbase may make, make a good sense. Now, these are all the architecture questions. Another thing I think is uh, is important is before you uh, jump uh, to, towards those uh, uh, optimization sharding because your system is overloaded and it can't handle anymore, it's good to consider wherever you had done the simple and uh, optimizations, which may be much easier to do than to go with a hardened uh, with a, a sharding project. What are those optimizations are? Well, first is the hardware, right? I have seen so many people trying to go and invent uh, some very advanced architectures when they are running on very, very uh, crappy hardware. Consider fast CPUs, and MySQL uh, runs uh, many things uh, in, the, uh, in the single thread, like for example, your single query will run only uh, on the, in the single thread uh, in MySQL at large, which means you want faster cores uh, more than uh, many cores. Plenty of memory. Uh, fitting your working set into memory can do magic to your performance. Flash storage, same thing, right? If you uh, go for IO bound workload to from uh, conventional drives to high performance flash storage, it will really feel like magic. And also good network, right? In terms of network, uh, even gigabit network is often enough MySQL, but what we often care is uh, the latency. You want to keep MySQL close to, uh, to a requester, for example, a web uh, application going through multiple routers and especially talking from application server in one data center to database uh, server in other data center or availability, availability zone right in the cloud, you may introduce huge amount of light, uh, latency. Uh, so be aware of that. Now, in terms of your uh, environment uh, beyond hardware, uh, Linux is the most common operating uh, system for MySQL, which is probably not a surprise for you. And uh, especially if you're using modern powerful hardware, using recent server-grade operating system is, uh, is good. Uh, Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, these are something that we see all used uh, uh, very commonly. Now, new MySQL versions also generally scale better. So, uh, uh, at this point, the uh, latest uh, GA is uh, MySQL 5.6, which scales significantly better for many workloads than MySQL uh, 5.6, and you can check it out. If you're even looking for even more performance, consider using Percona Server, which has uh, uh, some uh, additional optimization, or Percona Server Cluster PXC if you're looking for uh, clustering experience. MySQL configuration can also be uh, rather important. And uh, the really uh, going from some very bad uh, default configuration, which doesn't work well for your application, to a well-tuned MySQL can give you up to 3 to 10 uh, times performance boost. It can be significant, right? So uh, don't run MySQL with defaults. It's not designed for that. I have provided the link here, which is uh, about a uh, link to a webinar where I did 
about uh, MySQL configuration tuning for MySQL 5.6. Uh, I just suggested to check it out and I wouldn't go in much more details. Also consider the storage engine. If you look at the MySQL, I believe there are uh, two uh, uh, solid uh, transactional storage engines which are available right now. One is in the DB, which is default and which should be uh, your default choice. But if you are looking for high compression and have a lot of data and you would like to kind of see uh, more data to uh, fit uh, in memory or looking for high performance writes, then consider TokuDB uh, storage engine, which is uh, great for this kind of workloads. Now, the next question you may uh, think about sharding is, okay, so I'm doing sharding, when should I do that? Well, if you shard too early, you waste resources, you re, uh, reduce developer agility, right, and, and so on, it's not great. But if you delay sharding too, uh, too far, you can just run into a wall. When you have all those wonderful users coming in and you just can't uh, really scale to uh, accommodate them because your system is overloaded and you are unprepared. We probably heard the, uh, a lot of horror stories about this try, trying to start too late and that is a lot of people end up uh, sharding too early. Now when I approach a question of sharding, I like to think uh, it as a part of an uh, architectural runway. If you're doing something uh, as an agile uh, development methodology uh, in your organization, you sure had heard about that. And what architectural runway is show, uh, talks about is, okay, how far my current application architecture will tell, uh, take me, and then I will need to invest into redesigning it, right? So sharding is this one of the architecture con uh, uh, consideration and you should make it part of your architecture runway planning, right? Now, uh, the questions here uh, for you uh, would be, of course, to account for the growth uh, you expect for your application and other features you're running as well as how long it would take you to implement sharding. It's, uh, uh, it may be uh, very different uh, depending on the application. And I can tell you, I have see, similarly seen the customers who drive a simple application and they implemented sharding over weekend and some other companies which take many months to uh, really go to a uh, sharded uh, environment. Now, what we are saying is we want to do sharding so we don't run into a wall. So that gives us a very good question, okay, how do we know where the wall is, right? And this is done through their capacity planning, right? You need to do some uh, capacity planning such as uh, maybe benchmarks, right? Or analyzing the system and doing the estimates uh, how much more resources your workload will take over time. Now, what is important though here is we can, uh, you better be conservative if you estimate in capacity planning, right? Uh, even if you have done the benchmarks, uh, plan what reality will be a little bit worse. And never ever plan for linear scalability because no system uh, scale linearly, right? So if you could handle, let's say, 10,000 users or uh, on this box, right, and with CPU usage of 50%, you cannot say, well, that means I can handle up to 20,000, right? Uh, it will not work this way. Now, uh, I have spoke a lot about uh, uh, drawbacks uh, and sharding and why it is a pain, but there are also benefits for uh, for the sharding, right? It's always their trade-offs. Uh, trade and let's go through those uh, benefits which, uh, which you can uh, c consider. Well, the first one is what I will uh, call the ultimate scalability. Now, if you are going to build an application of Facebook scale, you have to sh uh, shard, right? Or do something, call a different walls and do something very similar to that. Even if you have some technology like which does uh, cluster on its own, like MySQL cluster or something else, you are not going to run single 
tightly coupled uh, system for petabytes of data. Because if something goes wrong, that is just too hard, uh, uh, too hard to maintain and deal with, right? So uh, you would see what in some cases, and uh, for example, in the Oracle uh, space, you would see a lot of very large-scale uh, systems actually will do a sharding over Oracle, uh, over set of Oracle clusters, right? Which each of them does something like an internal parallel process and sharding kind of internally and so on. Now, we can also use a sharding if you want to avoid other uh, complexities. And in some case, we may decide, hey, we understand we need to shard anyway, so instead of me trying to jump through all those hoops and get in their uh, the complex application uh, environment, why don't I just buy, uh, buy the bullet to do a sharding and I don't have to do anything of these other complex things. This especially applies if a sharding is uh, easy for you, right? So, for example, I see sharding being applied very easily for many software as a service applications, which may have uh, multiple users, where each user is completely isolated, right? And they don't users don't really talk to each other. In this case, we uh, the sharding comes easy and uh, almost natural. In some cases, sharding is even given, right? So, for example, if you are uh, having software as a service application where you're doing something like a Drupal hosting, right, a WordPress hosting, well, uh, given uh, different customers, different databases is the easiest way to do it out of a box. Trying to get it all together on single unshared application would actually be, uh, be harder to do, right? So, in this case, that uh, makes a lot of sense. So, the uh, complications you may avoid by just going straight away and implementing sharding could be avoiding caching, right, or uh, dealing with asynchronous replication. Now, this for uh, another consideration is what sharding allows you to do a much more uh, isolation between the data of your customers. Again, that's uh, maybe highly valuable for uh, software as a service application. If you start sharded, you can maintain uh, your data easily in the different databases or even on the, the different physical or virtual boxes if uh, your, some of your customers require that. And that can drive you with security, with compliance, or things such as keeping data closer to a user. In some sharded environment, uh, uh, you can uh, build an application so some users will, different users will go to a different data center and, and be data being shared, shared the same way will mean they talk to the data which resides in the same, uh, same uh, data center as well. Sharding can also help us to lower costs, right, because instead of uh, scaling up and buying a very powerful system, we may use uh, lower power systems uh, which uh, in your case, may give you better uh, better price performance. I think this is especially important in the hosted and the cloud environments, where uh, where the high powered boxes often come with uh, uh, with significantly more uh, more premium. So let's go through uh, the sharding and see what is the summary of uh, when to shard. Well, sh uh, shard didn't. If uh, sharding is easy in your case, you can consider doing it outright. But think not only about uh, how that impacts your development, but also how it impacts uh, operations. Right? When a scaling is impo impossible or, uh, or too expensive, uh, I have seen that often in the enterprise uh, or uh, the cloud, where some enterprise users may say, hey, well, there is no way we can get more than 16 gigabytes of memory for MySQL instance. That is all, all only as much as Ops team gives us and there is nothing we can do about that. So we, we have to shard, right? Well, that's kind of silly, but that may be reality for policy, right? Or uh, your application uh, grow makes sharding imminent, right? If you know what you are on such a steep curve, you will need to, to have sharded 
in in it, in a month to free anyway you may just uh, want to start uh, with that instead of uh, focus on other assist uh, other things that don't give you enough runway anyway so now let's talk about a few questions which go about uh, sharding what kind of sh questions we uh, want to answer one I will call the sharding level and the question here is wherever you shard on the database level or uh, the deployment unit, right? And what I mean by that is uh, there are many uh, applications would indeed shard on database and share things like application server load balancers and so on and so forth. However, would choose to separate those pieces as well, uh, often for uh, security and uh, compliance reasons, right? So, for example, if you have uh, two of uh, your customers are completely isolated, both an application server, a service and the a database, then it's, mu it's much more secure, right? If one of them getting hacked one way, there is no way to access the other uh, one's in, uh, data, even on database or application server level. Now, the other question you'll have to ask yourself is in terms of picking the sharding key or keys. And, the I, uh, and in many cases, this sharding key or keys is kind of natural. I shard by a company or by a user, uh, something like that. Now, the idea here is what the most of your quick queries should be going to a single shard, right? And I'm uh, speaking about the, uh, the single quick queries because uh, if you're running the, some analytical queries, right, like what Hadoop is good with, then your approach may be different, right? You actually may want to shard so, and separate all your data uniformly so your uh, analytical queries will be able to hit many nodes in parallel. But for your simple, you know, primary key lookup, fetch a couple of rows here, update a couple of rows there, you, it's much faster to just hit a single shard. Now, you want to make sure that no shard is too large in terms of data or load, right? So, for example, for this reason, sharding by country is a bad idea, right? Because then uh, maybe shard of uh, Romania would be convenient enough. A shard of China or United States is probably going to be uh, too much to, to handle. Now, what is also uh, important is what when you shard your data, in many cases, or, well, in some cases, it makes sense to double store or, uh, or even triple store your uh, data with different sharding keys to uh, improve the access pattern, right? And that is where uh, microservices also can be very helpful. So, for example, uh, uh, one of the social networking sites, they uh, uh, sort of provide the connections between movies. And, uh, it, and users, right? And their prevailing access may be even movie-driven by, hey, give me all the comments uh, about this movie, right? And so on and so forth, or user-driven. In their case, it makes sense to double store the data, in a sense, being sharded by the movie in one data layer and by the user uh, in another. The next question is uh, their sharding unit, right? Now, when you call about shard, what is it, right? Okay, we held, have a piece of data which belongs to a given user or organization. But is that going to a physical MySQL instance? Well, it makes sense, right? And uh, especially if your users are large, paying you lots of money, and you have some high-power software as a service, right? Because that gives you the most uh, uh, isolations for performance, security, and other reasons. You can put shard equals schema. Right? Or you can pull, put uh, uh, multiple shards per schema or uh, table. There is sort of, let's say, many-to-many -many relationship. You have many database or schemas per physical box, but each of them contains many users. Now, shard equals schema is a good approach if you are hosting or adapting third-party application. For example, if you're taking WordPress, Drupal, or uh, something else and hosting many of them, it's much easier to just shard uh, by, uh, by schema because that's not natural what application assumes. If uh, you are having huge amount of users which have very little data, again, your Facebook slash Twitter example, then given each user its own set of tables would be very expensive and you probably want uh, uh, multiple users 
uh, and then multiple tables of sch schemas per host as well. Now it's interesting with uh, sharding. What as you shard and you have many MySQL instances, many servers, then the, your chance of one of them uh, going down increases compared to single server application. So that means as you shard, the habitability uh, becomes even more important. So typically, when we are speaking about sharding, you're not going to shard across your single MySQL servers. You often would shard even something as uh, across MySQL replication clusters, being master, master, or master uh, slaves. Or we also see uh, people uh, sharding across multiple Percona XRDB cluster uh, clusters where uh, they can get a habitability and, uh, and uh, additional uh, read scaling from that. What kind of sharding technologies exist in those ways? Well, first. Uh, uh, to say is there is no one technology which is absolutely great and everybody is using in MySQL. If you use a law, uh, if you take a look at the top, I don't know, let's say 10 uh, applications using MySQL uh, in the internet, probably all of them are using roll their own uh, MySQL solution. There are some uh, other solutions to consider. One is VTES, which is a YouTube uh, user, which is an open source sharding framework, which is actually developed pretty uh, actively, so you can check it out. There is JetPants, which is another sharding open source sharding framework, which came from Tumblr, which is um, uh, less uh, actively developed. The third solution to check out uh, maybe uh, Shard Query, which is uh, designed and, uh, and implemented by our own uh, Justin Swanhard. And then I would mention a couple of uh, other solutions. One is a Clustrix, which is a, a closed source of kind of proprietary implementation, which on the other hand speaks MySQL protocol, and uh, we have seen some people using that for sharding successfully, or MySQL cluster, which also does internal sharding and would be uh, can be good sharding solution on the lower level. Just uh, if you're looking at that, don't think it, it's a magic bullet. Uh, please understand all the limitation and uh, operation complexities. Right? We don't uh, see everybody using the MySQL cluster in every application out there, uh, and there is a reason for that. Now, a few other sharding technologies uh, to mention. One is MySQL Fabric. This is official solution from MySQL team at Oracle. It's open source. It's EGA right now. This is the future of a sharding as uh, uh, Oracle sees it, right? And uh, uh, I think that's an interesting technology to watch. It's sort of quite limited to my taste to solve all the sharding problems at this point, but uh, uh, it may improve. Tesora virtualization uh, uh, engine. This is goes much further in terms of uh, sharding, and, it, and it's kind of uh, proxy which can be smart enough to root queries or uh, run queries on multiple nodes and aggregates uh, results. And it is also have been uh, uh, open source for uh, quite some time right now. There are also two commercial solutions, which is Scale Arc and, and uh, Scale Base, which uh, 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 we see number of people used uh, very uh, successfully and uh, they both offer uh, some support for, uh, the, for, for sharding. So now in the summary, uh, you can see that there are many technologies to assist you if you, uh, if you want uh, to shard when it comes to MySQL world. At the same time, there is no uh, single technology which you can say, hey, that is how sharding is done in MySQL and that is a standard way to do go. So you have to uh, use your judgment right and uh, they see what uh, is, works great from your application. Now on this note, I uh, also wanted to uh, cover a couple of other uh, small topics. Uh, the first one uh, is I wanted to use this opportunity to share some uh, some news uh, with you. We as uh, uh, Percona has acquired Tokutec and I think this is an, uh, an amazing news and very relevant for you as an audience because as I mentioned using Tokutec uh, uh, 
TokuDB storage engine of MySQL can uh, reduce the need for sharding or it can bring you much more uh, uh, efficient, uh, uh, much more efficiency. We as Percona will go into invest a lot uh, in the products, both TokuDB and uh, TokuMX, to offer Percona solution and services both for MySQL and uh, MongoDB ecosystems. I also want to say what sharding can be uh, can be complicated, and remember what we are there to help wherever you are. Uh, the customer of Percona support, uh, Percona consulting, or our managed services customers. We uh, really work with a lot of customers who uh, are doing sharding or who will help to design and implement sharding. So if you need some advice uh, or uh, some more long-term help, then uh, keep us in mind. We're here to help. And on this note, uh, I am going to open it for questions because I hope there are going to be uh, some good ones. Alice, it's all yours. Hi, Peter. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Audience, go ahead and enter any questions for Peter in the control panel window, the questions window, and I will go ahead and start reading them to you. All right, so the first question is, how much right scaling does PXC give? Yeah. Okay. That that is a very good question. So, um, in terms of P uh, PXC and the right scaling, it is a very workload dependent question, right? Uh, first of all, uh, because you use synchronous replication, there is an overhead. So you actually may be able to get in less rights from your environment than would you be able to do from single uh, corner server. Now. Uh, at the same time, it often uh, gives you better uh, performance than master-slave pair because it's able to uh, execute replication in parallel, right? And there we see MySQL replication clusters often bound not by their master write capacity but by ability to propagate writes through, or through replication. And yes, there is a uh, parallel replication in the MySQL 5.6, but it's not uh, quite complete uh, to the point of uh, how well PXC does it. Uh, now, uh, in other cases, we see actually quite good, uh, 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 quite good scalability with, uh, uh, with writes because uh, there is significant read component to the writes, right? So you have a lot of queries which end up uh, reading a lot of rows, right? and then only modifying a few, so what I would call heavy read update or delete queries. In this case, you can have a very significant uh, scalability of PXC, which can be multiple times. Okay. Uh, sorry, the questions are pouring in here, so I just lost my place. All right, so um, someone just had a follow-up. Uh, PXC is a read scalable solution. Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Yes, yes. So uh, with PXC, right, and why we see so many people uh, deploy that successfully those days is what it's uh, it's very easy to scale, read, and understand it, right? So with PXC, every node maintains all the copy of the data. So all the read uh, queries are handled with locally with no network communication, and it behaves the same as your well understood in the DB store, uh, storage engine. Okay, um, the next question. How soon will Percona allow Percona extra backup of TocoDB? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, uh, now we are uh, looking actively in how we can provide the hot backups for uh, TocoDB and mix it. TokuDB and InnoDB mixed environments, right? So that is a uh, engineering uh, question we are uh, working on uh, right now. Now, Percona Extra Backup, uh, right now, it's a very tightly uh, integrated InnoDB. It's based on how uh, InnoDB does uh, does crash recovery. Their uh, TokuDB design is different, and you cannot just use this uh, uh, the same. Uh, approach for TokuDB, same as you can't use uh, it for MySum, for example. Now, uh, at this point, if you are looking at the hot backup, uh, uh, I think using the 
LVM based solution is a uh, is a very good idea for mixed environments. We use that uh, ourselves for Percona Cloud tools, and uh, it works pretty well. Okay, cool. Next question is, um, what about the Spider Storage Engine? Well, yes, that, um, that is a good uh, good point. I uh, I should have uh, I should have mentioned that this is uh, indeed there is also their storage level uh, sharding level solution with uh, uh, with a spider which you can uh, you can check out. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, the next question is, what benchmarking tools do you recommend for figuring out where the proverbial wall is for a single MySQL server? Okay, yes, well, uh, this, is, this is the tricky question, All right? So, uh, I like to, uh, to uh, approach it in a, in a uh, the, in a couple of ways. One is what we are uh, using PT uh, log play, right, or uh, uh, Percona playback. In some other cases, uh, we are able to uh, capture the traffic uh, and uh, use uh, solutions like JMatter uh, or other uh, full application uh, stack load simulation to uh, 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 to drive a load and receive a bottleneck, uh, what what uh, breaks first, right? Because it may not uh, always be there, uh, be the database. Uh, another thing, what we uh, do if there is some uh, a, a current load, it uh, may be good uh, idea to uh, analyze their uh, workload to see uh, what exactly is uh, the, is happening, and, so, and you can often do a math to. See what is a uh, what is going to expect in the future, right? You can take a uh, see how much uh, I/O is is being taken, right? Or how much CPU use uh, is being used, and things like that, and see how those are going to change in the future. The challenge in this case is what, uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's not going to be linear, right? In a lot of cases, you. Uh, as, a, as the workload changes, you will have to deal with m more traffic, uh, right, on larger data site, and with your queries uh, being significantly more complicated than they have been. Okay, the next question is: Multi-master single slave model good for scaling writes? Multi-master single uh, single slave. Well, uh, if you're speaking about the MySQL ma uh, multi-master kind of master master it is uh, uh, it's not often not uh, a very uh, good idea right because the MySQL replication uh, is asynchronous it doesn't offer built-in conflict detection and uh, uh, and resolution and uh, that means you can uh, very easily bring your data out of sync without uh, notice in that, and also some of recovery scenarios can be uh, rather complicated. Some of the tools uh, uh, make it work better. For example, uh, MySQL cluster uh, replication has some uh, conflict detection and resolution, or there is also some work done in tungsten replicator, right? The uh, sort of a third-party replication tool for MySQL. All right, next question. I got a request from a customer who wants to keep the data which concerns him in a different database. Can sharding be a real good solution to avoid changing applications? Well, um, yeah, I'm not sure I, uh, I, understand, uh, I understand the question uh, in this case to to be honest, but that actually brings me to another interesting point, which I uh, don't mention right as a solution for uh, for sharding. Uh, one uh, thing you also should consider, right, if you are, if you have a lot of data on the system and it's getting slow, is to ask yourself a question: wherever all the data you have really should be on the system, right? In a lot of cases, uh, you may not need the data archives going back multiple years, right? Maybe those can be archived 
uh, offloaded from the systems, maybe put in some uh, offline data warehouse system, right, or uh, Hadoop or something li like that. So uh, to, uh, archiving is uh, another very good way to scale and potentially delay sharding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, how how does MySQL DBA service operations differ in sharded ecosystem against generic MySQL infrastructure? I'm not sure. Well, uh, okay. yeah, so I think uh, uh, the question is about the sharding, right? So yeah. uh, now I think in this case, it, uh, if you look at the MySQL DBA, right, working in a relatively small to medium size uh, application, you may have a uh, few MySQL servers in production, maybe a few more in development. Often they would have very defined roles. Oh, I have this guy is a master, right, and uh, this is a slave. Now, in a lot of cases, you will have to get the uh, automation, but it's uh, uh, not not really mandatory, right? If you're speaking about saying, hey, my application is sharded, and now I have uh, uh, 50 clusters, right, each can, uh, consisting of a master and slave, right, for example, or, or, or three nodes as a PXC cluster, then you really need to have their uh, automation and, uh, and the change management, right, and a lot of things uh, uh, being uh, carefully uh, uh, thought through, right? So, for example, uh, think about the cases like, well, I have to do either table on all the nodes. Well, mm, easy enough, right? You implement the scripts. Well, now the question is, how do we uh, ensure then, uh, how do you handle failures, right? What if that process happens, uh, fails on one of them, right? Because we also spoke with how the ability becomes an important component as there is a high probability of the nodes going down. How are you going to play up with the new shards being added, right? So when you are uh, bringing the new node, how do you get the, uh, it to, to make sure that it will uh, have a correct schema version, right? All, all those uh, things are, are going to be important, right, in uh, sharded uh, environment. So I think, but in a sense, it's much more process and much more automation. That is uh, the natural of it. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Peter, there are a few on the TocoDB. So the first is, um, is will TocoDB be open source? Is TocoDB open source? Yes. So the, the TocoDB is uh, is open source uh, storage engine, same as uh, uh, the, the, as the Percona server, and it's. Uh, it's available with uh, with Percona server. It's uh, pretty easy to install. It's just another another package you can install to enable that. And a follow up question is: Will Percona continue to develop TocoDB, and what frequency can we expect new releases? Yes. Well, uh, that is a uh, th that is a good question. Now uh, we are looking for. Uh, the very significant investment in both TocoDB and uh, uh, TocoMX. So yes, we will uh, actively uh, develop it, and we have idea about how to make it better, uh, and I mean like a lot better. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of frequency of releases, uh, the, that hasn't been decided yet. But most likely that uh, uh, will be uh, with a minor releases tied to a Percona server releases, and then. Uh, in terms of major releases, uh, if there uh, have to be some major design changes, right, or something, that will be tied uh, uh, to their uh, major Percona server uh, releases. Okay, and the last question, uh, back to sharding. On the topic of gathering data to learn when to shard, how do you evaluate the right performance overhead caused by your database indexes? How to case uh, right performance overhead? Well, uh, I think it's uh, like the first question is uh, I'm not sure what is the goal, right? Why do we want to separate the overhead of uh, updating the indexes versus just uh, updating the tables, let's say, with primary keys only? What I like to look uh, here at is uh, how much uh, overhead, how much load do different queries cause? 
And to do that, you can use uh, tools like uh, Percona Cloud Tools, which is a very you know easy to use a graphical tool which can show you the top where and how much relatively of uh, performance overhead uh, they cause, right? And how the performance changes, for example, if you add the indexes, or you can do uh, use PT Query Digest if you prefer prefer command line tools. Now, if you really need to understand how much overhead comes from indexes versus something else, then the way to do that is uh, you have a set of queries you run, right? You mm, uh, test them on the tables which don't have an indexes, and then you test them or the set of queries uh, on the tables with indexes added, right? So that is, would be a way to see what performance difference for maintaining the indexes itself is. Okay, great. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour, a little bit over. Peter, thank you so very much for a great webinar today. And audience, thank you for attending. Um, please join us for our next webinar, which is on May 6th. The topic is MySQL query optimization, which I know is a hot topic. Um, and with that said, thank you again, everybody. And Peter, thanks again. Hope you yeah. all have a great day. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.